welcoming you everybody. So we just want to thank our sponsors and that's Mask and Water. And they are a company that provides sustainable alternative water solutions through innovation. So all the things that are needed to realize this net positive state or any thing you want as part of your resilience, water resilience strategy in terms of technology and equipment, they're able to help with that, whether it's grey water treatment for reuse or it's wastewater treatment, and they're able to provide that help. Uh, so what can we look forward to for this uh, event here that we're talking about? So the International Living Future Institute is an NGO, is an organization based in, in the States. They are looking at that vision that you see posted on the screen there. And to realize that vision, they've created this ecosystem of different frameworks, if you like, of reach for regenerative design. So from the way the material is put together, how it is sourced, to the companies that will be doing that work. So if you think about uh, the just label, which is a label that you see there at the bottom of the screen, and at the top you see the living product challenge, so you're looking at the different products, to how the buildings themselves are assembled, we being those that are hosting this event, the Living Future Collaborative SA is really the advocacy arm, if you like, a local chapter of this year pro uh, that we we would like you to be a part of and and for our colleagues who are joining us from other countries like in Botswana or Zimbabwe, we would urge you to start your own collaborative there and we can continue to, to work together. So the collaborative at the moment, we've got collaborative facilitators and ambassador presenters, that's yours truly and Marlus Reining. The, there are a few people who have expressed interest in becoming part of the collaborative and post this event, we're going to start talking about the structure and other finer details on, on what the collaborative would look like and do. And so you're welcome to become part of it. And we invite you to, to join us uh, in this in this year journey in, in getting the word out there on what regenerative design involves. What's in store for today? Of course, you're in for a treat. We are looking at the national context of water and Dr. Chantel Ramcharan Gotze is going to present that to us. Uh, she's very knowledgeable about this space and has spent many years in it. We're going to look at an example where some of this thinking has already been used in, in the U.S. and in some cases where they've used the, the water petal, for instance, uh, applying that in, in a project. And that will be presented by Eric and Cara. And then finally, we will look at case studies. So we'll be looking at uh, an application of this. So these are speakers that we have a lot of respect for because of the amount of knowledge that they have acquired and experienced over the years, but more importantly, it's their humanity that one has respect for. So the first presentation we'll hear from is, is Dr. Chantel Ramcharan Kotze, and she's uh, been a specialist in strategic partnerships and business development with over 19 years of experience in the space and her passion lies in translating science to impact and value creation and she's currently at the water research commission so we're looking forward to your presentation so good morning and good afternoon and good evening wherever you are as tulani has said i'm i'm chantal and i'm from the water research commission in south africa I'm part of the business development and innovation branch, uh, looking at uh, impact and innovation. And I've been asked today to just give a, a quick overview of water security, innovation and sustainable growth in South Africa. And some of the points that uh, we are looking at as the commission. The, the first thing I would like to talk about is just set the scene in terms of South Africa being a water stress country. If you look at our water stress, we're sitting and, and ranked at 60, 65 out of 176 countries. We're in the red uh, in terms of uh, high to extremely water stress for the country. And uh, some of our studies have also been indicating between a 17 to 18 percent water deficit by 2030. If you look at some of our freshwater availability, we are ranked 148 out of 180 countries. Our, our freshwater availability also looks at not just uh, what is available in terms of quantity, but also quality. 
And if we start looking at average rainfall or precipitation in South Africa, we, we have an average annual rainfall of about 560 millimeters, almost half of the global average. We're also, if you combine that average annual potential uh, with evaporation of 1,300 millimeter results in very low conversion of rainfall into our stream flow. So South Africa has, you know, almost 800 large dams which store or can store up to 32 billion uh, cubic meters of water per annum. But we also realize that as much as we have the storage capacity, a number of our dams have been overly silted. So we, are, uh, we have a number of infrastructure issues in the country as well, in terms of how they are managed, as well as sedimentation challenges, uh, runoffs, and uh, upstream impacts uh, are linked to the efficiency and productivity of our large dams. If we look at this slide again, we, we're very good at capturing and storing and moving water to where it is needed in the country. If you look at, at Johannesburg and the Pretoria region, you're going to find that we, we perhaps have the most vivid example of a mismatch between where our population resides and where our water resources lie. We, we currently have about 12 million people that rely on water that is moved great distances, you know, 100 kilometers from the Val and before that from, from Lesotho, located at the top, if we have issues of top uh, of continental watershed, which also has implications for some of the downstream water quality in the country. So where does our water go? For a station, 3%, agriculture, our biggest uh, uh, consumer of water in the country, as well as our municipal and domestic and uh, livestock watering, nature conservation. Our, our industrial power generation and, and, and mining uh, are, are sitting between your, your, your two and three percent. But I think at the end of the day, you know, as much as where our water is allocated, it's also important to understand how much of this water is being put into the into the system and what is the quality of that water that is being put into the system and how it's regulated in terms of the quality of our surface water in the country. So I wanted to throw this slide in as well, and this is on sanitation. We have one of our speakers, Johnny, who knows this inside and out, but this slide is, is mostly to, to pique your interest about the fact that 40% of South Africa's water is flushed down the toilet. So as much as we have a number of issues and challenges regarding access to the gold standard of sanitation, we have various uh, facility types from pit latrines to ventilated pit latrines, flush toilets, etc., a number of issues linked to how that is impacting not only surface water, but also groundwater and the sanitation access per province in the country. So, yes, how do we start looking at water as a re as a strategic resource and how do we start moving into more innovative ways of managing our water? This is a diagram on the circular economy, and it's an ongoing conversation at the moment around what constitutes the circular economy, how does it fit into the green economy in South Africa, and how do we actually operationalize circular economy in the water sector? So there's a number of uh, models and conversations that are going on in the country, a number of, of communities of practice that are looking at you know, reuse, recycle, et cetera, how we bring that into a space where we can start applying it, for example, into a greening of buildings and uh, uh, communities and, and parks, et cetera. The water energy food nexus, very important, especially because of over 60% of our water is allocated to energy. Here again, we're trying to figure out how do we actually operationalize the WEF nexus. It's a wonderful concept, but we are still seeing that the uptake on the ground in terms of where this concept can be applied and the value that can, it can generate in terms of this intersector value is that still we still have not been able to operationalize that and start building on it. There are a number of policy and sectoral planning issues uh, around the alignment around it. It's not easy, and I think many countries have this have this issue. 
But alignment and integration, et cetera, is very important around this. And, and we are still working at getting this right. The reason I'm talking about or giving a bit of overview around water governance in the country is because it plays such an important role in terms of the impact, the efficiency and the delivery of water resources. I think we're, we're a very complicated country in terms of our water governance. In terms of our constitution, we have three spheres of government, local, provincial, national, each one very distinctive, all interrelated and independent. And there's this need that, or definitely a desire that there's cooperation and mutual trust and good faith amongst them. So at a national level, there's oversight policy making, uh, the management of water resources in terms of raw and water, bulk water supply. That happens at a national level, and that's with the Department of Water and Sanitation. And then all the way down to the local level, this is where the portable water supply systems, domestic wastewater and sewage disposal systems are managed. And so our current institutional landscape is, is, is quite interesting. We have operations and a number of entities that are involved in the operations around water governance in the country. The TCTA, we have a number of water boards, water service authorities, irrigation boards, and water use associations. And then around the regulation, we've had the CMAs or the catchment management agencies that were conceptualized and needed to be operationalized. But I think we've only got two functional CMAs in the country at the moment, and a lot of questions around the role of those CMAs, whether we should be moving uh, forward with them. Other considerations that are currently happening in the country are around an independent economic regulator for water, as well as an infrastructure agency and the role that these would play across operations and regulations. So in terms of policy and institutional landscape, it has a huge impact on the efficiency of uh, our water resource management. This is a, a slide that just gives you an, an idea of the complexity, how the accountability, the regulation and the reporting takes place between the each of the entities and how they report into the department itself, the national department itself. Innovation for water security, and this is this is an area that I'm quite passionate about. We've been working with uh, innovators and partners like uh, uh, Johnny Harrison and, and, and Isadima uh, and many others as the Water Research Commission uh, to support the pipeline development uh, for innovation. Within South Africa, we are well known for being contributors of research development and, and innovation particularly papers that are published. So everything sitting within the academic space, we tend to be world leaders around some of this. But when we start looking at innovation indicators, and one of those indicators around innovation is patents, we are higher on, you know, than normal on the average innovative capacity in the water sector. But at the same time, what we don't have is uptake. So we are innovating, but the uptake remains low. There are a number of traditional water uh, technologies and innovations that are, are still at play, still operational, and they continue to be supported. So we are also trying to look at what are some of the paradigms that need to be changed in terms of the uptake of water innovation to support water security in the country. And what do I mean by this? I think, and, and this is where I think a number of our, our water innovators have been uh, focusing. So if you look at what we what we normally do is we believe that water innovation sits within the technological or process innovation space. So right here in the purple space, which is quite small. So from lab to pilot to demonstration to scaling of these water innovations, this is predominantly where we play. But we usually think that this is where innovation starts and stops. If we start looking at some of the social innovation components around whether water innovations are actually quite acceptable to consumers and users, what are, what's the role of users if we look at this complex governance structure of water in the country? And, and I think, you know, within South Africa, we have the legacy of apartheid. We have uh, a number of redress issues. So the role of users, the role of communities becomes a very important aspect to consider in innovation for water, especially because water is seen as a, as a social good and not necessarily as a business. 
So how do we start looking at, at water and the water sector as a business? The, one of the biggest challenges, I think, for water innovators in South Africa is business model innovation. And this comes to how do we take this to market? How can it be sustainable? And when we talk about sustainability here, it's, it's not purely to respond to environmental needs or social needs, but it's also the financial models that are being applied. And here we work with a number of development finance institutions like the DBSA and uh, uh, the African Development Bank to start looking at how we can blend our business model innovation with social innovation. What we also do, and I think as we start moving towards integration of innovation for water security, we're also starting to see that there is a difference between the consumer base and the user base in South Africa. So who, who puts money into your pocket? We don't often ask that question. What, where we normally focus is how many people need toilets or how many people need a particular type of technology. We, we're very good at, at mapping the needs, but not necessarily mapping the market demand and whether there's going to be uptake of that and how do we actually navigate those pathways to, to develop or to support uptake of water innovations in the country. So there are a number of areas where we, as the Water Research Commission, are, are trying to work within the national system of innovation to support this uptake to enhance water security. So I hope you can see this, and my apologies if you can't. This was a study done in 2018 on the challenges linked to uptake of innovation. Again, there's limited links between various actors and institutions that came out very, very strongly. So the ability for the innovation system to, to work in the country is quite problematic. So as partners, we are working together on fixing that intellectual property related challenges and the policies to promote innovations. There's a lot of work being done there as well as within the transfer space. There's not much support for new innovations, as I've mentioned. If we look at our consumer base versus our user base, our municipalities in South Africa are ultimately our consumer base if water remains a social good. And Within that, there are so many complexities around working with policies such as the Municipal Finance Act and how uh, new technologies are taken on board. What are those re requirements and those criteria? So we are doing a lot of work with, with municipalities, universities and some of our research institutions on getting that right. Funding challenges for water innovations. This particular study provided feedback from innovators themselves. And what we found that if you ask an innovator whether there is sufficient funding for water innovations, they will obviously say no. However, I don't think that finance is the issue. Finance is not the issue. And it comes back to this slide on how we look at innovation and whether we are actually looking at the entire pathway of innovation and all of the requirements. Um, when we say that there, are, there is no finance and no funding for innovation. So are we ticking all of the right boxes for our funders, for our financiers, for our investors to be able to move forward with water projects and, and water technologies? Again, lack of access to markets for emerging innovations that also came out. Our market pathways are not very easy in the country. Uh, there's a lot of navigating to be done. Sometimes we as the WRC, we play that role to help navigate we have platforms such as uh, a wader, which is a water demonstration uh, platform to support test beds and demonstration sites in the country. And I think also the engagement with, with key local communities and stakeholders is something that's quite important if we start looking at the applicability of water technologies in the country, where we have a number of sites, locations in the country where traditional infrastructure just will not work. There's an, a number of models that are being developed between the WRC and the Development Bank of Southern Africa around working with communities on water implementation models, commercialization models, and the role of communities within a rural context. Just a few, just I think this is my last slide to, to close out on the discussion or the presentation is 
how do we achieve this sustainable growth? And if we as the water sector in South Africa are going to be moving forward and, and, and responding to water security challenges, we need to be looking at sustainable growth. We need to be looking at markets. We need to be looking at investments and models. Do we have sufficient work being done around market and demand analysis for our innovators, for categories and clusters of technologies? Uh, how do we navigate institutional barriers? And are we mapping opportunities? And are we able to, to actually quantify those opportunities in the way in which we can then respond to sustainable growth needs? Pricing, financing, and economic regulation. Major gaps at the moment, especially with regard to our pricing strategy in the country, which has not been finalized yet. It's been in draft format for, I think, almost eight years, seven years. And we are trying to, to now support that in terms of being able to uh, fill the gaps and, and, and finalize and have it uh, gazetted, et cetera. And then the investment and funding community. If we have to start looking at some of these emerging market opportunities and how we move to implementation, we also need to be very clear as the water sector on what the investment and funding community needs are to be able to support pipeline development. What are some of the barriers and enablers for implementation? Are we creating community, local economic development opportunities, beneficiation opportunities? Because these are some of the things that are really important if you're going to be working with public entities as well. And what are some of the partnership mechanisms that we can develop? There are a few examples in South Africa of public-private partnerships within the uh, Ukureleni, for example, municipality, where it has worked well and is a good st a case study for how PPPs can work well in, within the South African space. But I also think that when, when the water sector looks at PPPs, we currently look at the private sector as purely financing or investing and not so much as bringing in other competencies to support uh, operations and maintenance and the sustainability of some of the solutions and, and projects that we roll out. So I think there's still a, a bit of way to go in terms of how we look at these partnership mechanisms and how we look at innovations in terms of blended finance, etc. So that is me in terms of an overview around the water sector, water security in the country, as well as the innovation space and, and the kind of work that we are doing. Thank you very much. We're going to the US and looking at an example, the application of some of the things. So now we're jumping into some details of what's possible and what is being done from a technology perspective. So we'll hand over to Eric and Kara. So Eric is the Vice President of Natural Systems Utilities with over a decade of experience and has worked a lot in specialized wastewater operations and maintenance and net zero water and industrial water reuse. So we're interested in how that would be applied. And Kara is with him. And Kara has spent eight years working field seasons in rural Alaska, which is mighty interesting and worked closely with rural indigenous communities on acceptance and willingness to pay for an on-site water reuse system. So that's mighty interesting and an interesting perspective. If at some point in your presentation you're able to touch on that, that would be great. Okay, so over to you, Eric. So I will start off by answering, you know, for the context of, you know, here in the United States, and I think it applies to many areas around the world, you know, why on-site water recycling or on-site you know, water reuse is such an important aspect uh, to our infrastructure planning efforts and our goals to reach you know, net zero water and net positive water and really to, to do better, I'd say just generally with our water resources. We're coming to you from California and like South Africa, California is a drought state and we'll talk a little bit more about that later uh, in terms of providing water security for our communities, for agriculture, for our businesses. But that answer of why extends beyond just water security for us. You know, there's many drivers, one of which is our traditional wastewater treatment networks are characterized by a tree-like network structure that connect many different users or nodes within that network to a single wastewater treatment plant. 
you know, this model is really in contrast to other networks such as our transportation networks or our energy networks, which typically consist of multiple links between many distributed nodes and offer redundant routes within the overall network. Uh, but what we have here is that all these nodes, all these points of connection within the, the, the wastewater network tend to discharge to a single pump station or a single wastewater treatment plant. And when that plant goes offline, there's nowhere else for that sewage to go. And so due to that limited redundancy, that ultimately results in a resiliency challenge, which is also, you know, a really important part of, you know, our vision for infrastructure planning. Um, and that's led to a few key challenges I can share with you, you know, here in the United States, I'm not going to dwell on these, but, you know, we had a major storm event, Hurricane Sandy, that hit the East Coast of the United States. It fell on the New York City area. Uh, and when that happened, power outages took place, pump stations went down, and that resulted in this spilling of either untreated or partially treated wastewater into the bays, into the canals, uh, into the rivers. And, you know, we're not talking about insignificant amounts of water. It was 11 billion gallons that was overflowed. And so, you know, there was other hurricane events, some just being as simple as kind of storm events where equipment fails within, you know, the overall treatment network. You know, as I mentioned, with limited redundancy, uh, this was a case study from the Seattle area in Washington in the United States, where uh, during a major storm event, they spilled into the Puget Sound. After diagnosing the cause of the failure, they attributed it to level switches within uh, the wastewater network. And so the conventional system is prone to failures. It has its weak points. And so what we are out there promoting is this uh, resilient network with many different treatment systems within it and that at that on-site scale. Another major driver for us, you know, we're coming to you from the Bay Area, is sea level rise. You know, I won't uh, spend too much time on this slide, but a number of studies have looked at the forthcoming rise of sea level. Um, many coastal wastewater treatment plants locate their wastewater systems at the lowest elevation in the watershed. And so that tends to be, you know, at the coastal area, kind of at, at the beachhead. Um, and as sea level rises, they're anticipating that it will back up the wastewater system and impact, you know, frankly, millions of people around the United States should we hit that six foot level of sea level rise projection. Uh, but even at 10 feet, you know, 10.4 million people would have their services impacted. In the United States, again, we also have a major investment that's required in our infrastructure systems. And this is a kind of report card that our American Society of Civil Engineers puts out every couple of years. And it just shows that really in our wastewater, our water systems are in need of tremendous investment. And so, you know, we're out there thinking, well, before we invest all this money into the business as usual case, is there a better way to do this? And again, it comes back to water security you know, like South Africa here in California, um, we are a drought state, as I mentioned. We divert much of our water from the environment in the form of dams. We convey that water vast different distances to San Francisco, to Los Angeles, but we also pump a lot of groundwater. And so uh, that groundwater, uh, those aquifers actually support the Earth's crust. And as we we're pumping those aquifers down, we we're seeing subsidence of the Earth's crust, and, and this picture kind of tells that whole story where you're seeing, you know, many feet of subsidence, and, and what's happening is those aquifers are collapsing, and we're forever losing that storage that will not be available to us uh, in the future. And so, you know, that's to us a, a really strong signal of the challenges that we have ahead, and, and I know you guys have also seen many signals such as this. So this to us inspires us to do better. Uh, it inspires us to, to make this presentation, you know, early in the morning and get out of bed and, and really uh, try to promote a, a better model, I think, for our communities and our businesses. So, you know, that's kind of the background in, in terms of what's driving us. What I will now talk to you about is a little bit more of like the solution set and how we think about uh, delivering this kind of hybrid model where the centralized systems work in harmony with decentralized systems. I think. First is a, an important 
level of context of what scale we're, we're speaking to today. There's many different scales to do this. You know, you can do this at a single small building, you know, single family residence or an office building. What we are representing with our slides is um, slightly larger than that. Um, as a company, we tend to focus on, you know, mid-rise to high-rise buildings and campus kind of scale solutions. One of the important aspects to that is your solution may change. As you get to larger scale solutions, you may be looking at more robust technologies, a different technology set, as opposed to very small scale solutions, you might be looking at composting toilets. But you know that's not an option for you in a high rise building, for example. So I wanted to make that clear just as uh, because there are other solutions outside of what we're presenting here today. But, you know, our journey really started um, in New York City, you know, in the early 2000s. So, so this slide, you know, these buildings in green show uh, buildings that we uh, to this day have basically deployed um, complete wastewater treatment solutions in the basements of these buildings. So this is a really what is enabling us to go to net zero and to net positive is having demonstrated the feasibility of taking all of the building's wastewater, putting it into a treatment system, and then recycling all that wastewater within the building to service their toilets, to irrigate the surrounding you know, lawn and amenities, to service their cooling towers. Uh, and in some cases, they're even using that water in their laundry machines. So without these projects, I don't think we would have been able to do what we're doing today at you know, some of our tech campus clients. But so these are really important because I think this also, from a regulatory standpoint, allowed regulators in San Francisco and, and around the country to say, yeah, this has been working for 15 years in New York City. We think and we feel comfortable allowing this to happen now in our community. And so, you know, for 15 years now, you have 2,000 residents who are now being provided a renewable water source with zero permit exceedances in terms of water quality, uh, zero complaints or public health concerns within those buildings. Um, and so, you know, this has really opened a lot of doors for us. But um, as we start to think about that next application, what's really important to consider is, you know, there's a lot, of, as I mentioned, a lot of different ways to get to net zero and then net positive. There's many different sources of water for us to manage uh, at that on-site scale. And so this slide just gives you kind of a, a very general sense of kind of the the different influent water sources that we'll evaluate in putting together this water strategy, you know, starting at rainwater and stormwater. Um, you know, if that's available to us, you know, we're looking at the annual rainfall models uh, and trying to decide how much rainwater, how much stormwater can we rely on within that net zero or net positive water balance, that annual water balance. Um, here in California, you know, we are a drought state. We get most of our rain in just a few months. And so when you're trying to do net zero or net positive, you need to capture as much of that rain in those few wet months to try to get you through the entire dry season. And so you have massive amounts of storage to get to net zero or net positive. We also look at gray water and black water, you know, especially when you have very little rainwater and stormwater to meet, you then have to really get aggressive with how much of your water you're recycling and really reduce the amount of discharge from toilets and from cooling towers and the like. So you know, this slide kind of just shows you diagrammatically that as you go from rainwater to gray water to black water, you're seeing more and more progressively higher standards for the level of treatment that's required. But, you know, as you get to like gray water and black water, you know, oftentimes in the large urban context, it's not that different of a solution set. You know, both are going to require biological treatment, you know, we always recommend that for, for both solutions. And, you know, it might come down to like having RO or reverse osmosis on the tail end of a black water system. Um, and again, you need to think about these technologies and their energy impact. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in one of the next slides. But again, as, as we're working with our clients, you know, we are a design, build, operate contractor. 
And so we, you know, clients will approach us and bring us in to, to put together a water strategy to get them to net, you know, net better, I should say. But, you know, sometimes it's lead, you know, lead platinum, lead silver, lead gold. Other times they want to do the water pedal. And so it's net zero or net positive. Uh, and so as we are talking with clients about the solutions that are available to them, you start with kind of what sources are we going to capture? How are we going to treat it? And then once we determine the level of treatment that that's required, what solution set is most beneficial to the site? And so this slide kind of gives you two very or, or three very basic kind of options, you know, from natural treatment systems, wetland, you know, based systems, all the way up to more mechanical systems. You know, this really kind of gets you into like membrane bioreactors uh, and other advanced technologies. And this slide just means to provide a little bit of kind of context as to how each of these solutions score in terms of effluent quality, in terms of space efficiency, in terms of energy use also within the building, you know, as, as I mentioned, you know, energy use, these are high performing buildings. There's usually very progressive energy goals in addition to water goals. Uh, and so we have to, to work collaboratively with the other designers to make sure that we're on balance meeting the project goals. And so what I will do is turn it over to Kara here. We are delivering a water pedal project here in Silicon Valley. It's confidential projects, so I can't provide you any specifics on their system as much as I'd love to, but I will hand it over to Kara, and she'll talk a little bit more about the general solution sets that we're depicting here and what those solutions look like. So this is an example of a natural treatment process similar to the ones um, that Eric mentioned we're implementing here in California uh, as a wetland treatment process for uh, on-site net zero projects that have more uh, land use. And this method achieves the water quality requirements for non-potable water. The primary treatment starts typically with a septic tank, which separates and removes coarse debris and solids from the wastewater. Secondary treatment is on the wetland, which further removes nutrients and organics. Final is the tertiary treatment process, and this removes pathogens uh, such as bacteria and virus and disinfection for protozoa. This is looking more now at a mechanical treatment process. Uh, this would be using an MBR system. Um, this is more applicable for in-building systems. It uh, saves more space. The MBR um, just has a smaller footprint. And so here the primary treatment uh, begins with a screen instead of uh, using a larger septic tank. Um, the screen also removes debris, um, floaters. The secondary treatment in this process uses biological treatment which means that the microorganisms are doing the actual work of breaking down the organics and nutrients in the wastewater. <laughs> Our only job is to ensure that they have, the biology has the right environmental conditions so we can closely monitor and control the oxygen levels in this tank um, and adjust the aeration via blowers. The final step is tertiary treatment, uh, which is similar in that it utilizes a membrane system and disinfection to achieve water quality suitable for non-potable water that can be used in building for toilet flushing and irrigation here in California. Uh, the water quality criteria for the non-potable water reuse requirements are probably um, different depending on where you are, but these are the kind of systems that have worked for us. So energy consumption is always a um, big conversation topic here for net zero water projects because net zero energy is also an important goal for IL-5 projects. So the graph here is showing data collected by the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency. And on the vertical axis, um, it's showing energy per amount of wastewater produced. And the key takeaway here is that when comparing energy use with the MBR treatment train um, shown on the left, uh, they can use less energy compared to the um, vertical flow wetland data, which is um, shown closer or over to the right in the graph. And this is because there's less pumps required in an MBR system than in a wetland. Um, aeration is a high energy consumer, um, but is offset 
when compared to the recirculation needs of a wetland filter. And we don't like to assume that the wetland is lower energy, but the energy use should be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis um, for any of the water pedal projects, especially. And I did not prepare any slides on the research that I did prior to joining NSU in Alaska, but we were looking at an in-building system for rural communities that don't have any indoor water use. Um, and it was gonna be a non-potable system for flush toilets. I'm gonna hand it back over to Eric. Great, thanks, Kara. So, you know, just to kind of expand on the, on the net zero energy or solution set, you know, one of the things that we are pioneering just to, again, to think more comprehensively about how we integrate these systems. You know, as I mentioned, we're design, build, operate, contractor. We don't have a proprietary technology or solution that we're advocating for necessarily, you know, in terms of a treatment system, but we are the ones integrating these systems in, you know, a very thoughtful way. And so the energy piece being a very important discussion and aspect of this, and the overall integration. What we've started to do is essentially capture and recover thermal energy within the system. So, you know, as you are looking at more compact systems, you know, in-building systems, like the ones I was showing you in New York City, um, that's actually where we pioneered this. The wastewater that's coming from a residential bu building, for example, has a pretty significant amount of em embodied heat. Um, you know, you have your showers, you have your your laundry. And so we see that as an opportunity in terms of, I mean, that's ultimately what we're doing is being more thoughtful about our resources and recovering as much of those resources as possible. And so we're trying to capture that waste heat. Basically what we do is put a heat exchanger in that storage tank, capture, you know, 10 to 20 degrees F, uh, sorry, different units, how about 10 degrees C of waste heat that would otherwise be put, you know, down the drain. And then basically with a heat pump, use that to preheat the hot water system, you know? And, and so we went in and retrofitted a building, for example, that was using natural gas. Obviously we'd love to see more uh, in the way of electrification and electric hot water systems. But you know, this was a direct case study where we were offsetting around 65,000 BTUs per hour with that kind of preheated boiler system that we're, we had integrated, which offset around 400 kilowatt hours per day. And then when you start to look at, well, okay, that reduced a certain amount of energy on the, the hot water system, that amount of energy reduction was actually equal to or greater than the amount of energy it took to run the system. So, you know, this is one of the very few examples that I'm aware of anywhere in the world where, you know, these systems, you know, again, for a larger scale type project are being done on a net zero energy basis. And, you know, again, we just want to advocate in terms of how you're integrating these systems this is one of those opportunities that we always like to see pursued on a project that has, you know, very high performance building goals. And so that's the end of our slides. I'm, I'm happy to turn it over to the group. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. And thanks for, and, and Kara, thanks for touching on the, the signals there of, of what over abstraction is, is already doing. So now we're going to give our attention to Johnny Harris and the, presentation is going to give is now just you know highlights of some of the case studies application in the South African context taking into consideration some of the social issues as well as uh, some of the governance issues and then innovation uh, that uh, Chantel referred to earlier and Johnny is a civil engineer with over 20 years of experience in, in SA and in East Africa and the UK sectors so that wealth of experience we'd love to hear a bit more on that um, over to you Thanks, Jelani. If you're looking at trying to what, find out what the question was for what is the 19th of November, after these very high level, highly technology advanced systems, I'm now going to talk to you about something a bit more humble, which is the toilet. 19th of November is World Toilet Day. And why is World Toilet Day important? It's important because it's, it's critical that we raise awareness of the 2.5 billion people worldwide that don't have access to improved sanitation. And so what my talk is really going to be doing is within this water efficiency space, within the living building challenge context, I'm just going to be um, sharing with you and, and talking about 
the role of the toilet and the role of wastewater reuse as a critical component of achieving um, water efficient settlements and as my title said to to build thriving water water resilient uh, neighborhoods or cities so i was on a, another workshop um, earlier today also with the wrc so chantal it was good to good to see you here today and this morning was with the rest of the wrc launching some new sanitation facilities in south african schools you know we have a backlog in south africa which which we're starting to get on top of where our learners don't have access to proper sanitation and often that's driven by water shortages and then you know lack of available alternatives in terms of dry sanitation which which can work reliably this, this is the alternative so this is what our learners have been facing and this is why it's critical that we we really do prioritize world toilet day and why we we try and do things a bit better than they have been in the past the sustainable development goals goal number six clean water and sanitation it's really at the center of all of those 17 goals and it's got a close linkage to achieving many of the other goals um, you know whether it's health and well-being whether it's life on land poverty eradication and so on so you know toilets are, are important and they're important because we are a water scarce water stress world um, and, and Chantel also shared a similar slide just showing you you know, the state and, and the current condition of the water stress throughout the world and, and where we are heading. On the toilets, this is just a little bit of a history lesson for you guys. 1596, John Harrington invented the Ajax toilet. So toilets have been around with us for a long time. There wasn't a water seal in his toilet, but it did flush on 26 litres. And as we've advanced, kind of nothing's really changed much since since sort of early 2000. 2010, where we started to use dual flush toilets. You know, as as many of you will be aware, if you've got a, an older house with an with an old system, you're you're probably flushing on on a good 12 liters of water. A more efficient toilet might be flushing on six liters, or even sort of four and a half. But the worst thing is if you've got a toilet that you need to flush twice, because then although you think you're flushing on four and a half, you're actually only flushing on nine. To look at the sort of household water consumption. This is two scenarios here. So this is this is looking at the percentage of, of water used um, in a low income household and mid to high income households. Now, the, the, the thing I don't like about this slide is, is that the buckets are the same size. Although a low income household might be flushing 73% of its water down the toilet, actually they've got a much smaller bucket. And so they're actually being much more water efficient in other areas compared to the more affluent households, which will be more wasteful with their water use. So I would rather we shrunk the bucket and it looked more like this. But now you can see we've still got this 30, 37% or you know over half in, 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 in sort of lower income houses of water that's just being used primarily to convey that sewage down to um, a wastewater treatment facility. And, and the question is, is that good use of water? And when we are water scarce, when we're trying to achieve a, a net zero water or net positive water development, we just simply can't afford to be flushing potable water down the toilet. What we need to be doing is moving towards being a more water efficient household, reducing our overall consumption, or even a water recycling household. So you'll see there, we've, we've on that final bucket there, we've locked off the, the flush water because we can reuse our grey water at a household scale. And, and it's, not, it's not something that needs an incredibly sophisticated system to do so. The last uh, speakers shared about these, you know, creating these, these water reuse loops, you know, at a building scale. And it can be also done at a household scale. One, one project that we have been working on with support of the WRC was to look at a, a system that we're calling the Dewdrop. And this is a grey water recycling system. So that image on the left was, was the, one of the, the 20 prototypes that we installed in Cape Town, Joburg and, and in KZN. Those grey water systems you know, operate on about 5 watts of power. So it's a very small amount of power, but it's able to, to fully sustain and support the, the toilet flushing for a household. And any surplus water can then be used for, for irrigation uses. One, following the, the pilot study, we got great results. We produced sort of odour-free water. But one of the challenges was the installation. You know, digging around in the yard, you often hit an old foundation or an old pipe or something. And so, so what we've developed now is really this this vertical tower system. So, again, creating a, a vertical garden 
to treat grey water for the household and then provide that elevated storage so it's, it's available for toilet flushing. And for World Toilet Day, another project which I'm sure Chantel and, and others from the WRC will be very pleased to hear, we're getting very close to the finish line. So we, we developed a toilet called the Aramloo. The Aramloo based on the design of the Aram Lily. Our American friends might call it the Calla Lily. And really, the toilet is, is, takes the, the, the genius of nature with that vortex design. It's got, it's got about three or four different biomimetic aspects of it, which just improve the water efficiency. Now, the toilet, we're saying flushes on less than, less than two liters. Our trials show that it flushes very efficiently, still on 1.3 liters. And actually, we've got it flushing even with sort of 750 milliliters of water. So anyone who's from Cape Town in the audience would have probably been used to tipping buckets of water down the toilet during the droughts. Now, it's amazing how much water you need to try and get a toilet to flush. If you, if you took the Aramloo and you flushed literally a litre jug of water, it would clear the waste without any problem. Following 250 successful trials in the last couple of years, we're now moving forwards with the final version of this toilet. And we've, we've got to do it in plastic and in ceramic. The ceramic factory is busy as we speak, making the molds and the same for the for the plastic factory. So next year, you know, we were delayed with COVID, but next year we, we, we're excited, you know, at the beginning of the year to be launching the plastic and then towards the end of the year or, or the middle of the year, we'll be able to la launch the ceramic toilet. And and one of the important things about, about this is, you know, you can reduce your toilet flushing by a third or two a third and, and there's also a financial saving. Another huge thing is, you know, where we're a water scarce nation, where people are saying that we can't afford to flush toilets. Actually, if we all reduce our water consumption or we reuse grey water for flushing, then, then there will be enough water to go around. We've just got to use it more wisely. I'm just going to run through a few case studies that I've been involved with over the years. The first one is at the Sustainability Institute. I used to have an office there. Um, I wasn't responsible for the original design of this concept, but I was involved in, in the redesign of, of a new wetland system. Now, the Sustainability Institute uh, linked to Stellenbosch University. It's also Lyondock Eco Village. And what they've done there is they treat and reuse their, their wastewater for toilet flushing. So they've got dual plumbing, which means that their, their potable water consumption is probably about half what it would be otherwise. It's a mixed use development, so it's got the educational aspects, but it's also got low income and middle income houses. And so that, that system, and you can see there the constructed wetland. Now, one of the things that we, we try and do with our wetlands is make sure they're not just sort of a, a mono species. Not, it's not just a type of compensus or a reed, a reed bed. It really is a, a, a garden that we're trying to create. And, and that's a, a picture of that, that wetland fairly recently. Another project was we were involved with was called the Genius of Space. And space was for systems for for people's access to a clean environment. And the focus of this project in, in Landruck, in, in, in the Franschhoek Wine Valley, if you've ever been to South Africa and, and, and up to the winelands, then Franschhoek would definitely be in a place that you would have visited. It's one of our wealthiest neighborhoods, um, but it's also one of our poorest neighborhoods. And the people of Landruck, you know, mostly are using communal toilets. And with that, you know, there's no, no sewage connections to the home, which means gray water is tipped onto the streets because there really is nowhere else to dispose of it. And as a result, you've got this dirty water, which is flowing down the streets, creating a health hazard um, and just generally making the environment unpleasant and unsafe. This was just an extract of some water quality data. And this is the gray water that was flowing down the streets. So the, the scientists amongst you, you know, if you look at these figures here, these 11 million E. coli per 100 mils, a normal domestic wastewater would probably be around 3 million. So in reality, we've got a highly concentrated wastewater stream that's flowing down these streets. And the objective of the Genius of Space project was to try and capture this grey water and divert it towards a greening system to promote greening of the community. And so the two main components, the one was to create these disposal points, and the disposal points were one per five household. And then from there, the water, you know, had had a very rudimentary filter at the top, and this was a converted drum. It was the idea was it was all made from components that could be could be manufactured and built locally from the community. And from there, discharging into into some tree wells, 
And ultimately, if, if, if the tree wells became saturated, then it would then discharge into the stormwater sewer. One thing we didn't want to do was to overload the stormwater sewer because you know, the, the municipality there was, was concerned about limited capacity. The project was completed about five years ago. I had a colleague go and visit it two weeks ago. The municipality never really came on board with managing this project, despite being you know, um, a part of the process throughout. But the encouraging thing for me was those disposal points on the left and a couple of these tree gardens are still operational. And the, the picture there with the boys on the right was an alternative road design that we did as part of it. Whereas before, before the project was started, there would be grey water flowing down the streets and it remains clean. It remains um, with no, no grey water flowing down the streets. And that's really been operated and maintained by the community without, without municipal support. The next project is a, is a current one that I'm working on, and this, this is a Living Building Challenge project I'm working on. I think Denise is also on this call. Denise has been busy helping me from, from ENSA Earth Foundation. And this started life as, a, as an office development, then COVID hit, and now it's been rebranded as Medical Suites. And what this project is doing, we, our, our function was to provide assistance with the, the net zero water design. And so with that, we're looking at the whole system the whole water system, including the water, wastewater, uh, rainwater, harvesting, stormwater. Now, the objective of the Living Building Challenge is to mimic natural conditions. So the site receives on average 713 millimetres of rain a year. But it's important that we don't just collect all that water and not allow it to, to mimic a natural condition. So we need to include aspects of the design that will promote evaporation, we need to include systems that will promote infiltration. I think that Eric touched on this on one of his presentations. Because of the nature of the development and because of the availability of, of water, in terms of trying to achieve net, net positive water for this development, we really had no option but to reclaim and recycle black water. An office or, or a medical suite development of this nature doesn't produce a huge amount of grey water. So recycling, treating the grey water alone wouldn't enable us to, to take this development off grid. So what we've got is now a, is, is, is a system where we're recycling the, the, the wastewater for toilet flushing. And we're doing that using a, a number of, of treatment stages. A package, a package plant, actually, Maskin Water is, is the supplier of one of the systems that we're using at the front end. And then after that, we're going into planted gravel filter and then we go into, into the sort of ultrafiltration and, and disinfection stages to make sure that that water is, is fit for use, but also safe and hygienic for, for use. And, and we are storing 100% of the, of the potable water demand. So we're collecting it off the solar panels, the water is discharging into a tank in the basement, and then that water is then available to carry us through. There's, there's five fairly dry months in Johannesburg and, and the storage of that water um, is sufficient to carry us through. So that's in process, um, hopefully going to start construction early next year. And just to really illustrate the point again, you can see in a development of this type, it really is toilet flushing is, is a huge component um, of that water demand. And that's the same, you know, if you, if you were to look at a, a normal commercial development or a shopping centre, then, then the, the toilet flushing is going to increase as a percentage by even more. And it just really highlights, one, the need for being more efficient in our flush toilets, but the other to really explore options to, to reuse grey water or recirculate um, treated wastewater for toilet flushing. We really don't need to, um, to be flushing on potable water um, at all. And there you can see we've got this. So, so just to talk you through, if you can see on the, on the slide on the left there, we're harvesting the rain. The potable water uses are only ever using the harvested rainwater. We are filtering it and stabilizing it, making sure the pH is right, making sure it's pathogen free and sterilized. But then from there, we're producing a grey water stream, which goes to supplement and top up um, the wastewater recirculation loop. And it's an important aspect because if we just had a completely closed wastewater loop with no inflows, one is we would be expecting an elevation of salts. We didn't want to go for the reverse osmosis route because of the energy consumption. And so to have this supplementary streams coming in to, to make sure you don't get this elevation of salts is a really critical part of the treatment step. And we're using yeah, natural systems, low energy systems, 
as part of this treatment system. You can see on the graphic behind here, we've got this green facade, and now that serves two functions. One is it's the, it's the front face of the building. It's what people see when they drive down Call It Drive. But also, you know, coming back to my earlier comment, this is one of our main mechanisms for promoting evaporation. There's very little space elsewhere on the site for agriculture. There's a bit on the roof. But, but in terms of getting that evaporation function, we're really using that green facade to help us achieve this water balance and to mimic the, the natural conditions. Moving on, another case study we, we've done. Um, anyone who likes beer would have heard of SAB Breweries. This is the SAB Brewery site in Port Elizabeth, uh, now obviously owned by the international AB and Bev. So we were appointed last year to, to develop a 350 litre per day, kiloliter per day capacity treatment wetland for the recovery of their process water. So this development has nothing really to do with toilets, but it is illustrative of, of a system um, that could be used as a wastewater system. Uh, the 350 kilolitres a day from their bottle wash plant, it goes through this treatment stage. We had very stringent objectives in terms of our ammonia removal and the turbidity discharge. From there, there was a tertiary treatment system which was existing. And from there, it would go through this reverse osmosis plant and then back into the bottle wash. Very simply, the water flows through a free water surface wetland and then through um, two gravel wetlands. We've also got, for aeration, we're using ebb and flow, ebb and flow wetlands to, as part of the recirculation and the aeration function to make sure we're getting the ammonia removal that we needed and to make sure that we're, you know, we're not doing sort of high energy intensive um, blowers. One of the, the big novelties and attractions of this is the design is because it's not a, a fecal stream, so because it's not from, from toilet wastewater, we've got a nice nutrient source. Um, and with that, there's a huge revenue um, opportunity. So Rhodes University have been involved on this site for a while. And the model that we're looking at with them is, is looking at income generation opportunities, growing spinach, growing other crops on that wetland, which could then be used in the canteen of the brewery itself, but could also be sold to market elsewhere. And, and I think the important take home that I want to say about this case study, it's saving the brewery 200,000 rand a month. And, and so the payback on this becomes very short. And Port Elizabeth's been in the news recently because of the water scarcity. And, and it's just another reason why we need to be more creative and look, look more at the opportunities to, to reclaim and, and save water. This is, this is the, the, uh, the ebb and flow wetlands that are feeding into the system there. So you can see it's greened up nicely. And we've got a parallel treatment train. So we've got, you know, there's always one side we can shut off if there is ever for maintenance. But that's part of nature's, you know, plan. It's building resilience into your designs. Then I think my last case study is to look at schools. So this is probably, for me, the most important area that we need to try and tackle in worldwide, but especially in South Africa and other parts of Africa, India. Schools and our learners are not well served often by, by the sanitation facilities. We were fortunate enough to be able to assist with uh, some school sanitation in, in the Eastern Cape and in Popo last year. And we were involved in two aspects. One was trialing the Aramlu. So this was our prototype version that we were trialing in these schools. And the other thing that we were doing was, was designing and, and, and installing the, the passive treatment wetlands. And, and it follows a, a fairly conventional treatment phase. We've got, the, we've got a, a baffle reactor or a septic tank that feeds into the into the gravel wetland and then the, the discharge from there goes into into a tree filter now one could if they wanted to take it to another step you could do a, a very rudimentary um, final treatment step and recover that water but one of the objectives for this particular project was to have the treatment system as completely passive so what we didn't want was there to be sort of catastrophic failure if there was no energy so if there was power failures or or any disruption so these systems have got no mechanical parts they work completely by gravity. And just to highlight the, 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 the picture on the right there, this is the, on the left was the water coming, coming out of the ABR, and then on the right was the water coming out of the wetland. It really, the water really is crystal clear. It really doesn't smell. If you take the caps off those bottles, you'll get a very different experience from left to right. If they, if they wanted to upgrade this system and put a small sump and a recovery pump and, and, and a disinfection unit, they would be able to reuse that water for toilet flushing um, without any issues. This is my final slide, and, and I think really the, the sort of the thoughts that I'm wanting to leave us with and maybe lead us on into some 
discussion is that building thriving water resilient cities, firstly, it is achievable. And you've seen that not just from my presentation, but, but from, from the previous presenters. The second is it makes complete economic sense. So these systems no longer need to be a financial burden. Actually, they're, they're, they are a, a cost saving, a potential cost saving for clients. But lastly, it does require a fresh design approach. Often our, our sort of design codes and design regulations in South Africa, we've got the Red Book. And often these documents don't make space for, for this kind of creative thinking. And we do therefore need to, to challenge that. And it's good to have initiatives like the Living Building Challenge, like the Green Building Council South Africa, which really do stretch us. And my, my hope and aspiration is that we see that rolled out as the norm and not just the exception. So thank you very much. Uh, Johnny, maybe we could start with you for this Q&A, and, and it's about whether there's a case study published for this Genius of Space uh, project that you, you spoke about. In fact, any other project that you've got, but for this Genius of Space uh, project? Yeah so, yeah, so the Genius of Space, there were project reports written, which I can share with this group. That's no problem. Okay. Oh, great and then maybe just on the other side, so the two WRC research projects, so the Dewdrop and the and the Aramlu, were both started life as part of a WADA program, which Chantel did touch on. And so the, the WRC does have some some early project reports on those. We can also keep people informed and updated with with progress. Is this is this Matthew's uh, question on the on the chat? So. Generally speaking, and, and we have, we did start the trials of the Aramlu as a dual flush toilet. So in terms of cost, there's no difference to buy the toilet. So, so the Aramlu would be cost comparative in terms of buying the toilet. The, the difference is a dual flush toilet will probably flush on a six liter and a 4.5 liter. So when you look at average consumption, you're probably on somewhere around five liters per flush. Our average consumption um, would be to the order of, of about 1.5 litres per flush. So you're saving four litres a flush. If you're a household of, of five people, you're probably flushing 25 times per day, and then you can multiply it up to get your cost saving. And Chantel, are there any known schemes for water offsets for a project not able to achieve full net zero from on-site and off-site solutions? When you say offsets, are you meaning, are you meaning offsetting the water use from one development to another? It, it's unclear, but let's go with that. So let's say you, yeah, let's say on this specific project uh, that you're working on and you're unable to achieve it. I'm actually might put that question to Marlies if she's aware of any within the Living Building Challenge. I'm I'm not aware of any where that particular approach has been done. Not so much like as what we normally do with the net zero energy side, but there are ways of offsetting through um, hand printing. And hand printing is really doing good on another side. So through hand printing, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in our next uh, upcoming uh, webinar, you could possibly offside or offset uh, water. We're going to take just one last question, and then we'll have to bring the meeting to a close. It's how do you convince the SA government departments that the capital cost for water-wise systems is worth the long-term cost? and environmental benefits. That's from Trudy. Mm. Yes, so I think, you know, when we start looking at uh, uh, water-wise systems and anything that is different or alternative or disruptive in the space is not only to look at the capital costs, because I think that's often what we do, but we need to also then look at the operational maintenance costs that are going to go with it, because that's where we fall short within the South African market is not considering that. So if you take the capital costs and the O&M, and then you've got to make a business case for the uptake of this, I think uh, does does become a bit more challenging. However, we often put it forward as as financial costs. But if you start looking at the the value chain of either uh, sanitation solutions or water wise in, in general, then I think you're able to make the case a much stronger business case around that because it's not as, as simplistic as it may seem. 
But being able to speak to the implementation models and the business models then become very important beyond just the financial costs around this. There are a number of national targets and imperatives that can be built in that can then make it a lot more attractive. But you also need to be working with uh, government departments or authorities that are open to these sorts of engagements. And I think as the WRC, this is one of the areas that we are pushing through a number of our strategic partnerships with the South African Local Government Association, as well as with national departments quite widely. So we try to open up these markets for our innovators like Johnny. Thank you very much to the um, presenters. That was very informative and really highlights, you know, the scope that is within our hands. And I guess those communities of practice we've referred to, and many of us belong to, you know, are these areas where we can start pushing the boundary deliberately, knowing that we want to normalize and operationalize this thinking on regenerative design. So if you want to be part of the collaborative, drop us a mail, and you can follow us on LinkedIn and as well as Facebook. So in closing, we'd like to encourage you to become a member of the ILFI. Uh, do you know what it stands for? And to become and become an ambassador. So if you are out in Botswana or Zimbabwe, we encourage you to start a collaborative. Say thank you once again to our sponsors, Mascam Water. And thank you all for attending uh, this year uh, event. Mm -hmm.